going live and right now we are live right now yay hello lisa <laughs> good afternoon everybody this is lisa wilbur with uh, the blue hair <laughs> thank you for not mentioning that by the way <laughs> and we are joined by the ever lovely phaeton hassan yeah, very go. good thank awesome. you very much thank really you for inviting me on well, I really appreciate you coming on. You and I have a common uh, association, and that's the Go Giver Success Alliance, yes. which has been, I, I think my friends probably are sick of me talking about it because I, <laughs> for the last almost two years now, that's been everything I've been talking about. Um, what what prompted you, if you don't mind me asking, to, to join that? I had actually read the books. And I just loved them. They were small and it was like, I couldn't get enough of them. I read one after the other, after the other, I bought them all and read them all. <laughs> and um, I really, it just resonated with me. And um, interestingly enough, I just thought, um, I picked up the phone and I thought, I'll call Bob and ask him something. He probably won't pick up, right? And I'll just leave a message. He picked up, I was like, <laughs> oh my god hi <laughs> never pick up. he's amazing he picked up and he answered my questions and i hung up and i went wow you know this is real <laughs> <laughs> and you, you met him in person yet unfortunately not with corona and us not being able to travel oh yeah you know he's fiber. like six five or something like that he's really yeah he's really really tall <laughs> Really? I had no idea. I, th I thought you might not. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I'm only five, six, and yeah. I feel like a garden gnome. I'm like, uh, hi, Bob. <laughs> wow, I had no idea. I yeah, he's no really, idea. really tall. <laughs> wow. um, yeah, well, you know what? how you can get an idea is um, there's a picture of him standing next to Kathy, Tage now. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And you can see the size difference. I think she's probably my height or maybe a oh, little. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm hoping one day to get to meet them in person. They're lovely people. Oh, they're awesome. Did you know Kathy totally came up with her own last name? Yes. She totally I love she came up with it. So oh, no. I wish I had thought of that or met her and knew about that sooner because it's too late now because I use this too much but <laughs> I just love that idea I, I love that choosing your own uh, so what I if you don't mind where I'd like to start is um, for someone who lives right an hour and a half from where I was born and grew up it's fascinating to me that you were born somewhere else and you live in some totally different country. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us a little bit about like your background? Sure. So I was born in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, and I lived there um, till about my, I came when I was about nine years old. And it was really different, different culture, different alphabet, different even how we opened the book, you know, like here in, in, in the Western world, we will open the book this way when we when we're writing arabic we open it this way no i didn't know that i didn't know yeah that. yeah and you know again when you write in english this way but when you write arabic it's the opposite yeah. way oh so it's like completely and you were a school school child right you were in yeah, yeah yeah wow yeah. that must have been a hard thing to do yeah it, it will I, I mean the teachers um recommend it that I stopped reading and writing Arabic in order to pick up the English. Oh. I actually am very sorry I did that. I I still know the alphabet. I could write my name, but I'd like to go back and pick it up. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like that. Yeah. that I'm surprised your parents went along with that. Well, I, they, 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 they thought it was, would make things easier for easier. us, maybe. Yeah. No, that makes sense, though. But my mother never stopped speaking Arabic at home, so I speak it fluently. Uh, of course, the English has gotten into the Arabic. I have an accent. <laughs> but uh, I'm very grateful to her for not, you know, for not stopping to speak to Arabic. So, 
Because that, yeah, that must be hard for her to have made that. So did she speak any English? Oh, so that must have been hard for her. Is is the place where you live in Canada? It's Toronto, right? Yeah, yeah. Is that I'm where you lived when you were when you first? Yeah, moved over? yeah. Is yeah. that? I know that's not primarily French, though, right? That's. Uh, there is Quebec. Quebec is French. Right, but Toronto's not. Toronto is Toronto. It's mostly uh, oh. English. It's mostly yeah. English. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Where I'm south of Quebec in New Hampshire, okay. so. Uh, here in the school system, they tend to teach French to the kids instead of Spanish. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> and they yeah. don't they don't believe me that the language they really need as kids is Spanish. They think it's yeah. French. <laughs> I think that's cute. So you've almost had to deal with three languages. Uh, no, French in Egypt. That's English and French. But yeah. I... Um, like so you have Arabic and then the second language is either English or French and I went to uh, private English schools so I knew very little uh, where my cousin went to French private school so um, when I came to Canada I just stuck with English but I never really picked up any French because yeah I, I, when I went up there I had to go up there to do some work for Avon and mm -hmm. uh, I'd run into it some places where either the signs were all in French or something like that. And it was yeah. like <laughs> a little bit stuck there. Cause <laughs> when we took French in school, yeah, yeah. I, I can say go fish and how is your grandpa? That's, a good <laughs> That's right. just that when you learn French, when you learn any, any language in school and you don't really get involved into the culture and hearing it all the time, you, you know, but I know bonjour and au revoir. Mind you, there's a lot of Arabic words that are French, like batalon and chemise. Oh, I didn't know that. And, oh, yeah, and salon. And um, so there's a lot of, uh, uh, there are a lot of, uh, I guess, French words in the Arabic English. So that, 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 I, for some reason, that's fascinating to me. <laughs> so now as you're growing up as a child, so you grew up right in Toronto area, yes. Canada. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how did you get such an interest in, you're in the medical patient field as mm -hmm. far as, um, am I, have I got that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, it was um, a car accident. I had a really, really, really bad car accident, and um, and I, I remember the police officer get out, get out, get out, you know, the car could blow up, and um, I realized right there and then that anybody's life ends just like that at any time, and you know what have I done? What have I left behind? Um, and at that time, I really reflected a lot on life. And I had um, an honors uh, biology degree as an undergrad. And it was because of the help of, uh, of a doctor that really helped me come out of this, that I decided, well, I don't want to be a doctor. I never could be a doctor, but how can I go and help those who help the most vulnerable? And, you know, when people are sick, they're very vulnerable and they need help. And they look for the people who give them care. And I thought, I'd, I'd like to go in the background and, and do what I can to make a difference in people's lives. Um, and in Islam, uh, I'm a Muslim, there's, two, there's three things that outlive you. One is knowledge you leave behind. Two is something, a uh, good deed that keeps on giving, such as a lot of wealth. And three, a child who um, who prays for you. So I decided to write a book that leave the knowledge behind <laughs> and to, um, and especially to go in the healthcare sector and make a difference in people's lives, help those who need help. Oh, no, that's so, that's so awesome, though, because I've, I've had to deal with the healthcare system. Now, my mom, my mom's got Alzheimer's. And mm -hmm. before this, though, I haven't really had to deal with the healthcare system. And although I'm sure it's better than it was, I run across so many healthcare workers that seem irritated that we're using their <laughs> services. 
<laughs> and I guess because I haven't dealt with it that much, I expected to be treated like a customer. Yeah. And they 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 treat it like we should be grateful they're there, which I am, but I still expected to be treated like a customer. So I think it's needed. Yeah. It's needed what you're saying. Well, I think there's been a lot of improvement in healthcare in focusing on um, patient experience and um, including the voice of the, of the patient um, being put at the center because you start to see things from their perspective and then how to actually design processes taking into consideration the patient's voice. Because, uh, yeah, I like that. that. So that's the part that you focus on in the book is so you deal with the people that employ those people that deal with the customers, right? Right. I know they um, like to call yes. them patients. Yes. Well, actually, <laughs> it depends on which sector. So if in the long-term care home, they call them residents. In oh. hospitals, they call them patients. And in um, community health care center, they call them clients. See, and it's almost a shame, though, they don't stick with customer because <laughs> I think people forget that that's how they need to treat them. Well, you know? Yeah, I just think COVID has caused a lot of burnout for providers. Oh, OK. So you think okay. that's an, anom an anomaly that they're not uh, giving customer service that good? Yeah, no, I think, you know what, and like any other industry, um, it depends on the person, why they're in it, why are they doing their job? Because I'll tell you one thing, like I, the book is about data, data and how to improve data and how to make better decisions using data to improve patient care and, and um, efficiencies and so on. But when I work with teams to improve, I always, well, I used to, to find out where the bright spots are. So I'll give you an example. Um, in a long-term care home, one of the biggest problems was uh, seniors were falling and they were going to the hospital for UTIs and, um, and, 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 um, and, and hospital admissions. So we wanted to find out why they were getting UTIs. So, and I mean, we did some analysis and everything. But through my analysis, there, there were four home areas. Each home area had 30 seniors in them. And there was this one home area that had the lowest number of UTIs or hospital visits or admissions. Yeah. So I, I analyzed the data to figure out, okay, where exactly in that home area and who's responsible? for taking care of them, who's the personal support worker? And it was interesting. I asked her to speak on why her data was so good. What did she do? And she said, you know, I treat these people like my parents. Oh. And she said, I changed the diaper so they don't sit in it for a long time because when they do, they can get infections. And so, her why made she the wanted difference. to be made the difference. She yeah. was there to look after these people and she treated them the way she wanted to be treated. And so this is one way actually how data can help you make decisions and learn from your team. So I think it really comes down to also, even before COVID, it comes down to the provider, like anything else, I, whether you go to uh, a retail store or you go to a food shopping store if you ask for help it it's the kind of the, the person will make you either shut you off or actually help you by how they treat you it, it depends whether they want to be there or not and that's hard to screen for really especially i must be in medical because how would you how would you you know what i mean screen for someone who wants to treat patients like your parent yes that must um, be it is. I think there are certain traits that do come along, but again, that's now the specialty of HR. Right? Oh, HR right. now. So, to... so what your uh, book covers and what you hope to promote more is that the data can help them make those decisions, though. 
They can make informed decisions using data. I'll give you another example how, uh, I, in my book, I give this example, is that, um, you know, in any business, one of the highest costs is staff turnover, hmm. right? Because by the time you hire somebody again and, and, and bring them up to speed and training and everything, and then they start becoming fully functional, if you don't retain them, <laughs> You have to do it all again, right? Right. So yeah. their 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 turnover rate was very high, and they wanted to know why. So through the process that I explained in the book, I I I said to to HR manager, I said, could you please provide me with data for the past I don't know how many quarters she gave me at the time. I said so she brought it for me, and I said before we go any further, where are you getting this data? So that's, you know, and she said, I'm getting it from the finance director. I said, I'm, well, why is the finance director, how is the finance director using it and what does it mean? And he was using it to determine the number of people who worked and left, period. That included people who were on contract and their contract ended. It, that, and somebody who leaves when the contract ends is not turnover. Right. And she was taking that data and thinking it's turnover data when it wasn't because it included anybody who they let go, people who left because of contract. So what what I have and what we call is an operational definition, which is a definition of what does that data really mean. So you have to make sure you include the people who enter the data, the people who pull the data, and the people who use the data to make sure they're all on the same page and understand what the data is and what it means. And through that, we found the data completely different than what she what she got. Oh, oh that's funny. That's yeah. funny. And you know, Onita's on. Hi, Nita. Uh, in the con, if you click on comments, you can see what people are saying. Oh, thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. And Nita might be wondering. She didn't say this, but <laughs> uh, for those of you who um, uh, are in direct sales, like I am, it's important that we listen to guests that are outside of our industry and make that connection in our head. What she's saying does affect us. We just call it different things. We do have turnover in direct sales. We do have turnover of customers and team members, actually. So all of the things that you're saying does affect us. Yes. It's just that we have to make the translation in our head. So when we're talking about uh, the medical field or patients, just make the connection in your head. It could be team members or customers, but right. the same principles do apply. So <laughs> just wanted to add that because I, I don't think everybody necessarily realizes that they could get some really valuable information from just about anybody. You know oh, yes, I mean? for sure. Actually, when I um, work with my teams to come up with countermeasures to improve, we use cross industries where I go to other industries to try to get ideas. Oh, perfect. Because if you're continuously staying in your in industry and not see how somebody else does something, then there's no innovation, there's no change. Now, do you know in the medical uh, organizations, how do they or do they work on um, like building community amongst uh, employees, for example? so that people do leave less, or you don't know that part because that would be an HR problem? Um, so I think, um, I really, I don't think it, it's an HR problem as honestly as much as a leadership problem. Oh, a leadership, okay. That makes I do, and I think it is because leadership always has uh, certain goals they need to achieve. Right, whatever mm -hmm. leadership, whether it's business and they have targets to reach or sales or whatever. Right. And then there is the people who are actually doing the work to achieve those targets. Now, if there's not communication from the top level down to the front lines who do the work and then communication back from the front line to the top, then you have problems. And I have found communication to be the biggest problem. And one of the things I work very hard at is how to improve that communication at all levels and that it's not top control 
but it's really a joint effort because leadership knows what they want to achieve, but the front line knows how to achieve it. Well, and sometimes they don't want to, um, and I mean, you can correct me if I'm not right, but sometimes leadership either doesn't want to or, or can't legally say why they make a decision. And then it's harder to get the buy-in from the people who have to do it. You know what I mean? But it's not about the why. Okay, it's about I need to achieve X. Now, why they have to achieve it? I mean, it's usually good to give them the big picture so they know. But if leadership, and again, what leadership gives attention to is what everybody gives attention to. Right. right. So if leadership says, I have to achieve X, this is what I want. Then they go to the team and go, like, let's say sales. I need to have 100 sales in the next two weeks. I don't know. Just say. Yeah. And But the people who actually do the selling and do the calling, they come up with ideas as to maybe how to improve and increase. And then so, well, the, the command, like the senior executive is saying what they need to achieve. The frontline staff or the sales people will talk about how they could actually achieve it. And then they could achieve their goal, but through communication at all levels. Now that's awesome. So do you give uh, recommendations or what you do is basically analyze it and say, these are the areas that you need to work on? Well, um, so I work with, with, um, with organizations. And again, now this could apply to any business, the process. What does the process look like from beginning to end? Where are barriers? Where are bottlenecks? Where is um, information being passed not complete and accurate? Um, and then figuring out what those gaps are. And again, it's up to the frontline people who are, are in the process to communicate what the problem is. Now, what I find is this, in any organization, you have the sales department, the marketing department, the, like different department, HR department, yet, you know, the, the customer goes through all those different departments, one way or the other, the IT department. And so what you need to do is you need to have a process owner who sees the process as it goes from one department to the other, and then see how we can improve. Because one department on themselves, well, they could achieve great success. Think of a team in a rowing boat. One team member could be rowing really fast and doing <laughs> great by themselves. The canoe or the boat is going to go that way. What you need is everybody rowing at the same pace and knowing what to do so you could take the boat in the direction you want or the canoe or whatever in the direction you want. So I really help them as well understand their processes, figure out what the bottlenecks are, figuring out where there's a disconnect, um, and then putting things in place to improve them. So you could actually, not that you'd want to because you like to specialize in medical, but you, you're, uh, from what I read, you said you like to work with small and medium companies, but you could, sounds like you could go into any company and. Yeah. And, and any service company. Like I just worked with a lawyer. Oh, where yeah. They, yeah. So they had uh, problems with uh, real estate deals. And we actually, I mean, it was phenomenal. We, we decreased the, the length of time for reporting letters from six months to two days. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was just something they didn't see because they're too close to it? Well, the beauty of um, continuous improvement or process improvement is you actually visualize it, right? You use sticky notes and you put it all out on the wall. No. Oh. And then when there is a gap, it goes, I use a different color sticky notes. And so if it's red, like there's a, there's a problem, then you, you, you could stand back and see all these yellow and red and, and green and decision points. And, and, and especially when there's handoffs. So we do a swim lane when there's handoff from one department to the other, what happens there? Are they getting the information they need? So it, it takes something that you can't see and makes it. And as Deming says, um, people can improve a process if they can't see it. 
Oh, yeah. I like that with the sticky notes. I'm thinking how I'm going to do that here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can yeah. tell you how to do it. I can tell yeah. you how to do it. There That's are different ways. I mean, the basic is um, the process mapping, which is using sticky notes at the detail level. But you could also do it at the senior management level where you do a value stream map where you're doing it between departments and finding where the gaps are between departments. Yeah, Nita's saying, um, Nita's an Avon representative with me. Uh, she's saying um, uh, what we, uh, yes, it does affect us in what we do by looking at what other uh, companies do. My senior customers are like my family, how I connect with them. So that's why she's good, of course. Yes. Uh, the majority of customers are my actual close friends. The rest are new friends. Yes. So, yeah, and I, I think in direct sales, that's one of the things is customers can just go down the store and buy a lot of the stuff that are sold that way. Right. They actually want to buy for the interaction yes. between the person, the service. So Yeah, and that, also I think they trust her. They trust yes. her, uh, what she says. If they like her. I, you know, what does Bob always say? They know you like you and trust you. No, like and trust. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so that you built that. If you go to any store and buy that, you're not going to get that. You know, yeah. it's funny with the go giver thing. Um, I I knew him. I knew Bob before that came out. Uh, so endless referrals was my reference point with Bob. But mm -hmm. um, uh, it felt like something I already knew. And yet, the more we do. I would say do the group, the more we're involved in the group and involved in different people and different circumstances, it seems like the more we're able to work on, the, it, it's a skill. It, it is really a skill. is a skill. It's I don't think it's a natural thing that comes to you, the go-giver philosophy necessarily. I think it is a skill. Do you, do you think that too? I do. And I think, you know, when I think about a lot of the books I read, and it's about it's all about them, right? I mean, people always, and it's interesting because when I start a new project, I, I always tell the team, what's in it for you is if we fix this process, it'll make your life easier, less rework, and less hassles, and less frustration. You have to answer what's in it for them. Like, why should they? Because, well, continuous improvement is about change management, right? And People don't like change and people no. resist change. No. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> and, and continuous improvement, you know, is made up of four parts, and one part of it is psychology, and it's the change management piece. And you need to look at mindsets, you need to look at why they would, you know, why should you change it? We've always done it this way. I, th I think it's hard too. I, I'm glad I don't work at. Uh, a corporation and work for corporate, <laughs> yeah. but I, because I've had to go to meetings with them guys, I think I've, I've realized over time though, that when you're in only one department, which I'm in the sales department as an independent, but still, um, I try to tell my other sales associates that we're not seeing the whole tapestry. We're only seeing our little backside of it. So for instance, when they discontinue a product, the sales representatives all yell and I'm like, listen, it couldn't have been selling well. They don't just discontinue stuff we're making money on. <laughs> but I, I'm surprised how many people don't think of that. They I just think they're upset because the product's gone. They're not thinking the company has to make money or yes. they can't keep it. Exactly. It's and this is where communication is so important. And this is also where communication between departments like that, where I was talking about value stream mapping, where management is seeing what's happening between one department and the next and the next. And I'm being able to communicate because like you said, somebody in one department could get really angry at the department before them. Because <laughs> yeah. they, and, and, and the people in the department before them, sometimes they don't know and relationships go on. But when they actually get into the room and start having a conversation about why, oh, is that why you did it? Oh, is that why? Then things change. And the salespeople go. You know, the marketing people maybe decided we're not going to sell anymore because 
the sales drops and nobody's interested in it. And again, it's about asking the right questions. It, it really goes down to asking the right questions, collecting the data to answer those questions, and then sharing that data, communicating it across departments. Yeah, and I, I think it's hard because I, I don't, they, they don't normally do that. So I guess it would be um, up to us to just realize that that happens because I, you know, I try to tell people that are angry for a discontinued product, for example, it's either that we didn't sell enough of it or the margin wasn't big enough for them to make enough money or we can't get the supply of it. There, there's a reason. They're not just taking it away to make you angry. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> that is unlikely. <laughs> For sure, because the, they want to make money. I mean, obviously yes. they want to make money. Yeah. So they're not going to stop something that's making money. But I wanted to go back to something you said, small to medium size organization. Why I work with small to medium size oh, that's organizations. Good yeah, because I talked about change management. The bigger the organization, the more red tape that's involved. Oh, of course. <laughs> so where if you have small to medium, I find that actually uh, leadership comes and they get involved on with the team. And so they start seeing and hearing what's going on and they're able to remove barriers and things could move a lot quicker. Now, if you are talking to now on the on this call, listening to the replay, you're going to find... Um, people that are leaders that have teams like me, um, what would your suggestion be to help them um, improve, you know, their processes? Well, it depends on what process they want to improve. Um, so I always look, we have, you know, at the beginning, I have to be very clear on scope, like what's the start, what's the end, um, like is it, is it a product? launch is it a product they, like i don't know what process they want to improve so the first thing i do is create a project charter which gives us clarity exact clarity on what the problem is how it's impacting who what they want to achieve what data do we have to understand the current state like where are we now mm -hmm. and you know and now what are some things that could um impact us achieving our goal. And then from there, depending on what I call a fence post, my right? this side and this side, based on that fence post, I identify the team members that need to be on that team because you just don't just include whoever you want. You right. have to actually include people from that process. So that's the first thing. So getting clarity on what they want to achieve, who to include, who the team members are and what process it is. Then next we would do something like um, depending on it, what, what the process is, it could be process mapping, could be value stream mapping, which if it's leadership, it's probably value stream mapping. Um, and you could think of value stream mapping as being in the helicopter looking down at all the departments. And then yeah. think of process mapping or metric based process map. It's a detailed within one process. So so how do you get them to not just point fingers at each other? <laughs> very easily by like looking your problem. <laughs> by very easily looking at when you do value street mapping, for example, you just see how much time is between one department and another. And if you find that there's a very long time, you say, Why is that happening? And it's not who. There's no shame, no blame. With QI, there's never shame or blame because it's not the people. There's no bad people. There's bad it's processes. The process. Okay. okay. So when you're talking about a function, you talk about the actual function, not the person that does the function. Right. Right. That was right. It. Yeah, that's awesome. It's it's the people don't get up in the morning and go to work because they want to do a bad job. They don't. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's they a, go. That's you know, point. <laughs> yeah, they go. They want to do a good job. They get demotivated when they run into the same problems and nobody's addressing it. And that's why. I was mentioning before, there's something called Gumba, Gumba Walk, where you actually have a leader come down to the front and just walk and ask questions and be curious and see. And it's never about, it's about being really curious. Why would that happen that way? Or, you know, but it's it's not the people. And it, it, I don't know if you agree with this statement, but it's not necessarily that the leader can fix it, but that he listens or she listens. Well, he could definitely 
put in place things that can fix it. They can't. Okay. Yeah. What they if, can, it's, if it's uh, I don't the the, re, I, the reason I was saying that is sometimes people genuinely want to be heard. Oh, definitely. Even if it's something like, for example, with the discontinued product, nothing I can do about that. But lots of times, if I just let them say whatever they're going to say about it, and I can't fix it, but they feel heard. Communication. That's Back to communication, it. right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good point. <laughs> Number one thing I have found is communication. Wow. that That's kind of neat, though, that... <laughs> <laughs> so that you can go in there and analyze stuff like that. Yeah. We were talking before we went live. We are so different as far as um, they have, they provide us with a ton of uh, detailed information and I use none of it. <laughs> you pro <laughs> right. You probably are like, how do you even operate in your world? <laughs> <laughs> but mine is more, I don't know. I, and people that know me don't consider me a feelings person, but it's, it's more like if I'm speaking to an audience, I can, I would base it on their reaction more than I would. I don't know something that I know for sure. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't you're, know. Use, you're using, yeah. Well, I mean, that's part of it. That's part of it. I mean, um, what I really find interesting when I meet teams and, and senior managers, you really got to look at body language, verbal cues, power gradients, because sometimes when you have executive directors and frontline staff, they're afraid to say anything. No. Oh. Uh, so there's a power gradient. Um, right. um, and actually, this is why it's usually a good idea to bring somebody like myself from outside the organization in because there's a, the, the chances are higher that I'm going to find out what the real root causes are because they fear if they share it with their direct report that there will be repercussions or loss of a job. or. You know what? I didn't know all that was going on when I was first in this. Um, I call it the pecking order, which yeah. I'm sure you've heard that before. <laughs> and I, I thought as an independent representative, I wasn't in the pecking order. But of course, uh, there's also a pecking order among the representatives. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which, right. Uh, there just is. I don't think that you can get away from the pecking order you <laughs> you have to do you you, you yeah. could if, i mean as again if it's small to medium size and if if their goal is to really identify what the problems are it's not about pecking order it's about conversation having the conversation of understanding and listening and hearing like you said because listening and hearing are two different so they things. just have to make sure they're not afraid of their yeah that there's no repercussions they report to yeah yeah so okay. how have you run into it where that's been hard to get the person upstream not to have repercussions to the person downstream yes so if i i'll have one-on-one -on -one interviews um, I will talk to them. I'll find out what the problems are, but then I'll surface it in a uh, in a way that doesn't touch that employee. So you know, here are some things that we've identified. Like I'll do brainstorming sessions where everybody writes on a sticky note with the same black pen, well, so we can't, can't tell. tell. That's a good idea. Uh, there's there's a tool called the Affinity Diagram, and now even you can do it virtually with Zoom where you start the whiteboard and people just pick a sticky note and start typing. You don't know who's typing. And so you ask a question at the top. Why are people having a problem with whatever? Like you're asking why why something is happening. And then you brainstorm and, and actually before I have them put the sticky notes, I just I just talk about the problem. Why is it and I just get everybody thinking about it and being in that frame of mind. Then we put the question on top, and then I just ask everybody to please pick a sticky note and type. Now, we don't know who's typing. It's all anonymous. 
And then the next thing I ask them to do is take the sticky notes and group them into themes, like the same kind of theme. Oh, nice. And if, if one sticky note could go into two different spots, I ask them to duplicate it. Then once we have into themes, I take each theme and I have it a different color. So this theme number one is all yellow, theme number two is all orange, theme number three is all blue, and theme number four is all green. And then I say, now give it a heading. So what is that theme? What is the problem here? And they'll put it on top. So now we have the big picture of what the problems are. Everybody's able to voice anonymously there, whatever the problem is, and now we can start addressing it. So has anybody brought you in where they're like, I have no idea what the problem is? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> so then you have to do that first, right? Well, yeah. I mean, they don't know what the problem is, but they'll know what process it is that's causing it. Or they're not reaching. Like, they're bringing me in for a specific reason because of a target not being reached. Or because usually there's, um, so there was, um, a burning platform, you know, leadership always when there's a burning platform and in healthcare, it's somebody who dies, many patients who die because of, oh, yeah. and I cannot, I'm not going to disclose where I think this is a true story. Um, but this, a burning platform can be in any business and it could be anything, right? It could be right. whatever. So if we take the healthcare example, it could be, um, they had like five or six deaths because of the same problem within two or three days. So you had to figure what out. Right? Had to figure out where yeah. what happened. And it was actually due to people who were about to have surgery and they were giving them blood thinners. So what they were using was an old form and the old form had already blood thinners on it and then oh. they added the addition so they were doubling the blood. I bet that must be hard because they're trying they're almost trying to avoid finding out because that might make them liable. Yeah. Well you have to find out. Um, but in healthcare in healthcare these are called you know like they're adverse events. They happen all the time. Yeah. They happen yes. all the time. And right. so you have to go in and find out. Yeah. Wow. Um, and you know, there's a lot of problems with drug to drug interactions. Pharmacy is another right. very big problem. Yeah. So again, different different industries, but they still have the same kind of major issues they have to address. Yeah. So they sort of know where. The other thing you mentioned in your, I, I was reading your focus, the spotlight, when you did the spotlight and the go-giver thing, is mm -hmm. uh, meeting the regulatory requirements. That's got to be mm -hmm. a big, big thing, right? Mm -hmm. Do a yeah, lot of yeah. people uh, come to you because they're not meeting them and they need to? Yes, if they're, if they're not meeting any uh, requirements or um, if they're not meeting stakeholders, accountability targets, they're afraid of losing funding or anything. That's really yeah. what moves people, right? Right, right. A crisis, right? <laughs> yes. And actually, that's what I say in my book is that you know, it's interesting because I was doing research um, and it, I'm trying to remember the number of um, or the percent of CEOs and CFOs who don't know just how bad their data is until a crisis happens. Oh. And then they go, why didn't we know? Why didn't we have the numbers? Why? Right. It's because they were working with good data quality to begin with. Yes. So, I mean, if you take that and you translate it into business, if you have a uh, a list of clients that always order from where you have a good database. If you don't have the right phone number or right address or right mailing list or whatever, you're going to have problems. Right. So there are key elements to every client that you want to make sure those key elements are always right. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense though. And it, why I thought about the regulatory thing is um, where my mother is at assisted living, it's a, a young guy. He's only in his 30s. He inherited the bill, the business from his grandmother. And it's the 16 residents only. And it's a beautiful house. They live in an old uh, Victorian looking house. And he is on that all the time because the state is on him yeah. all the time. So he has so many things he has to juggle. 
And it's, it's, a, it's amazing to watch from, I own a business in a different category, but he owns a business that he has so much regulation to deal with. It's, it's kind of awe inspiring to watch him work. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I had one client who had to meet a certain requirement. And when we worked on it, they improved so much, they didn't believe them. They came and checked in and went, let me <laughs> prove to me that you did this because it's going to be true. You can't go from 30% to improving to 90%. What did wow. you do? Um, because we had all the documentation of what we did and how we changed the processes and so on and so on. Wow, you, you made me want to look at all my stuff, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, some processes are invisible. Right, um, right. It's well, and if, when you've been doing the same thing for a long time, too, that's yeah. tough, too, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, because it goes into a computer, this or this, so you, you don't see it, but you have to make it visible. Um, the other thing we did too, and this easily can work in any com company, is you think of a patient, a client going through, once you've done the process of they go from this department to this department, whatever it may be, is you take that again and you go and look at it from an experience perspective. How did they feel? Or did, was, was the patient frustrated? Did they have to wait too long? Did somebody you know, speak to them up because they were worried about this test, like the experience piece. And so now you can actually also go and improve on their experience. Because wasn't it Bob? Who was it that, I think it was Bob when he was talking about how you make people feel. It's also, I don't know, maybe it was somebody else. But it was also about how you make somebody feel makes a difference. Oh, yes, definitely. Def I know dealing with the medical people with my mother's situation, Right. Mm -hmm. We have one doctor that's really good at it. One of them isn't. <laughs> and I want to, I want to see the one that's good at it. Of course. So, of course. Right. Yeah. Of course. Of course, of course. Doesn't everybody. So let, let's get back to your book and also the people listening to this, mm -hmm. how are they going to know if someone that's because they might themselves not be someone who could use your service or need the book, but I bet you they know someone who would know that. So do you you do help people outside of Canada? I'm thinking. Oh, for sure, we can do it virtually. I've been. I mean, with 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 the COVID nineteen, we've all had to go virtual. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily have to be Canada for sure. No. Although no. I know I know plenty of people in Canada. Also, it would be small to medium businesses that are struggling with an issue. Of process yeah. yeah and the reason why I, I i usually like to help them is because i like to use their organization as a living lab and what i mean by that is i bring the training to build the cap cap capability and capacity and skill level in their organization because once they know the process to follow to solve the problem the problem solving journey they could apply it to any other solution where I find when you take a staff member out and you send them to somewhere for training, the theory is not connected to their work. They don't see how it applies. So, but when I go in and we actually do an improvement, pro uh, improvement project on their own work that's directly related to a business goal or objective, there's a win-win. The leader gets to achieve their goal and build capacity. And then the people learning actually the learning makes sense because it applies to what they're doing. Well, and don't the other people around them learn as well? Of course. So that if you just sent the one person, then the other people that's don't right. it too. That that's perfect. That yeah, is yeah. awesome. So when your book is not out at the moment, but it's coming. Yeah. It's coming. Hopefully, it'll be out soon. Um, I'm that's just awesome. uh, just re, re, you know I'm just going through my last. Uh, for a chapter just to make sure I'm happy with the flow and everything then I got to send it to the editor and then hopefully um, it'll uh, go for layout and be printed and in it I actually have uh, included some um, tools that they'll download if they buy the book they get the tools um, which help them identify the key key metrics for each 
department, finance or HR or, or marketing. And then the next thing is how to identify the process measure, which you can impact, which actually what drives to improve the actual measure you want, how to find the right relevant one, because people don't know how to do that. And then how to make sure that you're collecting the data to the right standards to meet what you want. And then the final thing is how to put a process in place to continue to make, make sure those key elements are always um, uh, high quality data for good decision making. You know, I, I like the fact that you right away at the beginning said you should question where the data is coming from. Oh, yeah. Because translated over to us, I, I know an example of that is um, I see a lot of people follow people because they have a lot of followers on social media, but they don't necessarily have any credentials in the thing they're teaching. Yes. They, they're, they're not, they're not personally big sellers or big leaders. They're just big teachers. Yeah. So and it's I, fine as long as you know that. <laughs> right. Yeah. You should question where you're getting your data from. <laughs> yes, for sure. For sure. For sure. Always. Well, remember that example of the HR? We took it from the finance director. Right. It didn't, it didn't meet the HR's needs, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. That's kind of funny that it's so different. So what what's next up on the on the schedule for you you're wrapping up the book but what's what's your future projects look like um i think i would like just because i'm very passionate about improving data and the problems that we see in data in every industry i, I i'm thinking of putting or maybe even coming up with a community where they can come and join like a book club where oh. i go through chapter by chapter explain it answer any questions just help people to improve their data and then so i'm thinking of doing that well that's what do you think awesome, of that idea that is a good idea yeah that, yes that's an awesome idea yeah i i think um and anything you should give it a try and see you know what if it runs across your mind try it because sometimes mm -hmm. the things that end up being a really good idea at first blush you don't think it's going to be right I guess. So and somebody said to me, you don't have to wait till the book is published. You could actually just start. True. You could just start. I mean, start with chapter one. I mean, there's eleven chapters. So even if I did, you know, one every two weeks and I did one session on a chapter, it'll be out before I get into chapter three or four. Yes. And then I'll get a lot of um people who will benefit from it and at the same time, um help me understand what their needs are so that I could provide more value. No, that's perfect. Did you know, um, I don't know if you probably weren't on the call when uh, Jeff and I had the epiphany about the whole blue hair book. No, thing. no. But that was a year and a half ago. It took him a few tries before he convinced me it was a good idea. <laughs> Right, because <laughs> I'm thinking uh, I'm not sure I want to be known as the lady with the blue hair. <laughs> hey, you're standing out. You're different. And yet, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, no, yeah, yeah. I just got this done probably less than a week ago, so I've got a blue tint all over, like I'm a Smurfette. Because <laughs> it gets, good. yeah, even my fingernails are all blue still. Oh yeah, yeah, it comes off a little at first. <laughs> Did he? Did you notice he's going to do it too? Oh yeah, he said he was going to. And I remember somebody in the group said, "And you can't just pretend and put like a marker. You actually have to." <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Boy, well, so yeah. to see. It, they do have temporary hair coloring, but yeah. even my hairdresser said, um, "Don't tell him." But <laughs> even the temporary, it takes you a while to. Oh really? To get out to get out. It's not like a couple washes and it's gone. Yeah, it takes a while. <laughs> did you have? Did you go do it professionally? Oh, I did. Yes. Oh. Okay. Oh, I don't. I don't drill my own teeth or color my own hair. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, even during COVID, when she wasn't supposed to do it, my hairdresser called me on the phone and she said, "Don't do not do that yourself. You yeah. come over and have coffee or something, and we'll do it." at my sink in my house or something, because I do not want to have to fix that after you do it yourself. 
Yeah, I think she has no confidence in my hair coloring ability. And I've never, never done it myself. Even when I was broke, I never uh -huh. did my own hair. It just was one of those things like um, doing my own teeth, uh, you know, it was a professional service that I thought professionals did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's definitely, they're <coughs> artists. They're artists. Whether it's hair cutting, bathing, oh, the yeah. That and how you can't them. get the back good if you do it yourself. I don't think. How do you? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Of course, in the book, um, Jeff had it. So the ladies, the lady with the blue hair is balayage, which is a, a lot of different colored blue. Oh, yeah. A very, a, that's not what I've got. <laughs> no. if, if he feels that important, though, he can have his like that. Because <laughs> that's like from, I, I, it took me about three hours to get this. It'd be like five hours the other way. <laughs> uh, Nita said, it's what is going on today. It's Lisa. <laughs> it's Lisa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, indeedy. So, did you have some last minute things you'd like to think? I like that your uh, mission statement, by the way, was I help leaders improve performance and use data to make informed decisions that impact people's lives. That is so awesome. Thank you. That's, that is really what I wanted to do. I wanted to impact people's lives, especially when people are so vulnerable. Oh, I, and yeah. And, you know, I'm as a family member of someone who now has to use services, I feel vulnerable yeah. because I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what's best. And she's uh, suddenly my mother can't help me make decisions. Right. And right. The whole 59 of my first years, she was, pretty much running the show for herself. So suddenly she's not making the decisions. It's me. And that's uncomfortable. <laughs> well, caretakers care for like caretakers get burned out. So be careful. Right. That's right. 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 Well, I've got, my brother, I've got a brother. Oh, okay. good. That will help. So, yeah. That helps. Yeah, yeah, that will but, help. And she did have, I, I guess I didn't ask enough questions ahead until it was, I thought she had, she, I thought she had it on the ball until she didn't. I didn't, I didn't see the slow decline, I guess, because we, we lived in the same, in the same house yeah. and I didn't see it happening fast enough, I guess. Yes. I was just thinking, oh, she forgot her keys. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, then, keys, yeah. By the time I realized what was going on, I couldn't ask her some stuff. So then I, when I'm looking through her paperwork, she doesn't know any of that stuff anymore. So no. it's like, oh, no. That <laughs> so is hard. Ask ahead, people. Ask your yes. parents ahead. <laughs> Can yeah. she recognize you? Oh, she does now, yeah. Oh, that's she does not other people, though. I'm, I'm, it's getting to be where I'm the one. You know, she doesn't recognize some of the other people or yeah. the stories and stuff. So yeah. I'm expecting that to be the case not yeah. you know not too long but but yeah. she's doing good so far so i'm glad she's at assisted living up here it's a beautiful place and they're mm -hmm. they're fun and i i trust that man running it oh good it's that's important next, it's a good situation at least so yeah 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 that's good you'll get a feeling and when you go visit you'll know whether it's a good place or not right that's a, really really important Right. She's been, she's been there a year already. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, it's only eight miles from me, which I'm happy about. And you know, it's like Bob said, no like, and trust. We went there because someone I know, like, and trust has his mother-in-law there. Yeah. And I know and like, and trust this other person for 20 years. So when I was looking, he right away said, I've got a place that would be perfect. So. Right. Yeah, it's funny how it's more about referrals than it is almost yeah. anything else. Yeah, it is. So. It is. When no like and trust, you'll. Great, right. no fun. like and trust. <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Um, I'm going to put this up on uh, my YouTube. And right it for all of you who want to get a hold of Phaeton, her email address is right there under her name. Mm -hmm. And 
there's a group on Facebook called Monday Morning Madness that supports the show. And you are welcome to put your ordering information for the book as soon as you have it available. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you very, very much. I well, really appreciate that. Thank you. And I, I'll probably see you on Wednesday. Uh, yes. No, I'm in a conference all day downtown. Toronto. Oh, okay. darn. Well, oh, next okay. time. Next, <laughs> so next week. If you stay right there for a second, we'll go back to the green room. But I'll stop okay. the recording. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. you.